Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs. I'm the Associate Director of Author Events here, and I am honored to introduce our guest this evening. An outspoken Christian reproductive justice advocate, Dr. Willie Parker is board chair for the group Physicians for Reproductive Health and provides abortions at the last remaining clinic in Mississippi. His many awards include the Planned Parenthood Margaret Sanger Award, and he was honored by the United Nations Office of Human Rights as one of 12 women's human rights defenders at the World Conference on Women. In his new book, Dr. Parker delves into his religious upbringing in Alabama and his love of science and medicine, making a case for access to abortion and outlining his belief that the Christian thing to do is help women in need without judgment. Tonight, he'll be joined in conversation with Dr. James Peterson, Director of Africana Studies and Associate Professor of English at Lehigh University, host of WHYY's podcast, The Remix, and a regular contributor to MSNBC Media. Please welcome Drs. James Peterson and Willie Parker to the Free Library. Let me first uh, say that um, unlike you, for as long as I can remember politically, I was pro-choice, right? You had an incredible uh, conversion. But we do have some things in common. And I think the thing that struck me initially in reading the book was that um, we both like books on tape. <laughs> and and um, so I, I don't remember the gentleman who read your book, but I listened to your book okay. on tape. So it was, it was a strange thing to hear you talk about how you listen to books on tape as I'm listening to your book on right. tape. Um, but, but that connection for me was the foundation that really pulled me into your narrative. Sure. Um, and, and for folks who haven't read it, this is a must-read book um, for anybody who is thinking critically uh, around the issues of women's reproductive health and reproductive rights. Um, it is the most powerful, uh, most complex, and at the same time, the most accessible thing that I've read on these topics and on these issues uh, in my entire time reading about political issues around this matter. So kudos to you for, for, for incredible work. Thank I should you. also say at the outset that I will spoil a few things, unfortunately, just because some of the questions that I need to ask uh, get into the nitty gritty. Uh, of, of, of the work, but Doc, I wonder if we could first just start off by you giving us a synopsis of your conversion. Um, because I think, I think one component, and I think this, there are many, many components to the moral argument that you make here. Um, and by the way, I think there are a lot of folks who understand that we need a moral argument uh, in favor of women's reproductive health at this particular moment. Um, but can you share with folks your conversion? Because one of the great um, uh, um, advantages that you have is, is that you understand um, inherently what the sort of moral majority uh, is trying to argue. You're able to pick apart their argument because you know where it comes from. So can you just kind of share with the audience what your conversion was, how you came to um, uh, have a change of heart and mind, as you say, around, around this issue? Sure. So there were a couple of conversions. First, let me acknowledge and thank you, that was a tremendous amount of chemistry we had in the back and our shared love around books. And I must admit, you struck a nerve because when you told me you listened to my book, that could have been my voice. They didn't let it me read my been. own book. Why? Why though? Why? We need a write-in campaign well, next, Simon and Schuster. It, it, it should have been the your next voice. Bot, the next the next one. The next, next one. Okay, okay. But when, uh, so uh, can, my, my initial religious conversion had to do with growing up in the South, and I like to say that I, I fancy uh, religious understanding to be in my DNA, mm -hmm. the tremendous uh, role that the black church played in the kind of hope and vision of the black community uh, meant that I grew up in church, mm -hmm. black Baptist church. Uh, and what that meant for me, I had a traditional upbringing. Uh, there was no pro-life, pro-choice narrative, but what was uh, kind of implied is that when uh, young women became pregnant in my community, there were lots of teen pregnancies and single women. They were expected to continue the pregnancy. So I witnessed uh, a stratified uh, morality around reproduction. And so I had my born again experience at the age of 15, religious conversion, and uh, had a traditional upbringing in the South in poverty. I uh, didn't realize I was poor until I applied to college and saw the, the, the poverty level. That's the first time I heard of the poverty level. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but went away to college at Berea College, had you know um, a solid college career, and only thought about abortion once mm. when I wrote a paper as a as a freshman, uh, and in that encouraged by a professor, encouraged, so. right? 
And um, in that paper, at least I had sense enough, rather than just waxing, um, defaulting to abortion is murder or abortion is wrong, because this is 1981, the pro-life, pro-choice narrative had not taken off. Right. So I just sort of hoped that women would be thoughtful and prayerful about their decision. Went all the way through college. In college, I don't remember knowing about any young woman who got jammed up and needed an abortion. I don't know where they would have gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made it to medical school without really having to engage this issue. Uh, uh, ch chose OBGYN. And that was the first time I had to confront what it meant to choose be, to be a woman's health provider mm -hmm. and see women with unplanned, unwanted pregnancies or wanted, beliefly flawed ones. Mm -hmm. And never being set against abortion, and yet being unclear about what it meant for me morally to provide them, I just didn't have that, that I hadn't processed it. And mm -hmm. so I chose to err on the side of not violating my conscience. And through residency, uh, I saw one abortion. I trained in Cincinnati where Planned Parenthood was bombed, and mm -hmm. so my institution didn't court it. I lived in a part of California where there was no abortion access in the county. And so I was just cruising along until I got to Hawaii as a professor and came face to face with an administrator who was denying women the access to abortion, even though in Hawaii, abortion was a non-issue since 1971, one of the first states to legalize it. The culture was that you know women could get that care, but this administrator was fundamentalist Christian and decided that it, in his, and consistent with his faith and his authority, mm -hmm. that he would deny it. And that brought me to a crisis point. Mm -hmm. I was supportive of women, and so I had to have a second conversion. Just, because, just as I was encumbered by my religious understanding, I needed something comparable in religious significance to bring me out. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was the interaction with uh, this crisis moment that I was mm -hmm. in, and listening to uh, the, Speeches. the speech by Dr. King, the mm -hmm. mountaintop sermon, for the umpteenth time, but hearing it in a different context mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. And besides his just melodious cadence about, I may not get there with you, mm -hmm. there was another part of that sermon that just hit me square in my gut. Mm -hmm. It's where he described what made the Good Samaritan good. Mm -hmm. He talked about the person who had been robbed and left on the side of the road. Everybody else from his community passed him by and said, what will happen to me if I stop to help him? This could be a setup. Mm -hmm. could be his, his boy could be around the corner. That's right. um, but he said the, the Samaritan reversed the question of concern and asked, what will happen to this person if I don't stop? Mm. And I saw myself in that story, mm. facing women who asking me for help. And then so I, cho I had to make the decision at that point to, to align myself with the compassion that I found to be in my Christian understanding mm -hmm. as opposed to the social convention and conforming to the custom of being opposed to abortion. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I had to turn the corner. And so then for me, it became, uh, I became uncomfortable not providing abortion mm -hmm. when I knew what women faced. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Good Samaritan passage in the book is really powerful. Just because it's a conversion within a conversion, right? Because you, you, you sort of change the subject positions of it in terms of your interpretation of that passage, right. by the way, which from the pulpit is not always brought to us that way, right? right. Um, and again, using the tools of the same language that we think represents this moral majority to rethink your engagement. Also, the women that you were, that the, the, the women who I think you were advising and mentoring, were, the, were they residents? They also took that risk in that Hawaii hospital to say, hey, we're going to work on our own to figure out a way to provide you. That activism on the ground also inspired right. you. So the, it, was, it was, you know, and they say, and a child shall lead them. So here are these six women who had selected me as their mentor because they thought I represented an approach to women's care that was respectful and comprehensive. And yet they were more compassionate and activists, and they were being defined by their compassion. And I was like, And they were more vulnerable right, than you. Right, right, right. They were more vulnerable. So Professionally. All right. I just felt uh, first convicted and then convinced mm -hmm. that I had to uh, step up, and I became less concerned about what might happen to me right. than about what happens to women when this care is not available. So, so that, I mean, women, um, the women in your life are featured prominently uh, throughout the book, and I, I think there's a few of these things I would love for you to share with the audience. One, to go back to my earlier question, can you talk a little bit about how the public shaming 
of a pregnant teen in your church really impacted you and really made you ask some of the questions that too often we just don't ask about the fathers of these uh, uh, of these uh, potential uh, pregnancies. And then share with us a little bit what, what you're willing to share here about, about your mom who had an extraordinary impact on, on, on your life. Um, and Ernestine, your, your, your sure. sister. There, there are other women who have obviously influenced your, your development, but I think about that teen pregnancy and I think about obviously your mom who you talk a lot about in the book, very emotional about in the book, uh, but also Ernestine has, you know, this. your own family brought some of this home for you as well. Sure. Uh, growing up in church and then uh, when I had my born again experience and what was impressive to me about the, 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 the Christian narrative of uh, new starts, new chances, redemption. radical equality, mm -hmm. redemption, love, uh, and then seeing that all of a sudden gendered by uh, our hormones kick in and, yeah. you know, and, 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 and um, boys and girls become sexually active. When the young lady became pregnant, or for those of us who were active in church, uh, uh, when it became common knowledge that she was pregnant, uh, she had to sit down. She wasn't allowed to participate in public ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, but the guy who got her pregnant may, if, if he didn't cop to it, I never saw a young man have to stand up and acknowledge his premarital sexuality mm -hmm. in the way younger women. Mm -hmm. And there was something about hearing the verse that says, and in Christ there's no, uh, Jew, no, no Jew nor Greek, no, no bond nor free, but all are one in Christ, and yet there's different moral consequences to sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's just, I didn't have the feminist language or the critical thinking skills to kind of process it, mm -hmm. but something in my you gut told me it, was, it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then so, most, uh, I, I grew up in a home with no father figure. Mm -hmm. How, however, in my community, I like to say I had daddy by committee mm -hmm. because, you know, my friends who had nuclear families, if we went to the store, if their dad bought them an ice cream cone, he bought me one. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were mischieving, their dad didn't spank me, he spanked them and he sent me home. And I lived in a place where they said, boy, go home, and you went, mm -hmm. right? And uh, double jeopardy, if you didn't go home, you're, you got a beating uh, because somebody had to address you in the street, and there was no such thing as double jeopardy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my mom uh, raised six of us. There's six kids with six different fathers, and all I knew was somebody who was a strong provider, who was a nurturer, who was a mother and a father, mm -hmm. and uh, to the point... Uh, 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 what led me to understand that the nuclear family is overrated. I wouldn't begrudge anybody who has one. Mm -hmm. But my mother, when I once asked her who my father was, he said, who, she said, who feeds you? <laughs> who, who puts clothes on your back? Who puts a roof over your head? Yeah, you do. Then I'm your mama and your daddy, mm -hmm. right? Your dad is whoever I say it is, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and uh, that was the end of that question. And, you know, but the significance of that is later at my mother's funeral, somebody comes and says, we believe that my uncle is your father. Would you like to meet him? You said no. And I said no, because uh, at this point, it would felt like a dishonoring of the woman that we were about, who was there for me. This person had not uh, taught me how to tie a tie, taught me how to talk to girls, none of that. And uh, it wasn't uh, that nobody needs a father. It was just that at 27, about to graduate from medical school, I didn't need a father figure. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, all the father I need was in that casket. Mm. So my mother, the nurturance, the compassion, the sensitivity, you know, uh, the big hands, I got that all from her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that same love ethic uh, allowed me to come full circle when it came to dealing with my 14-year-old sister mm -hmm. who became pregnant during my senior year in high school when I was uh, a, a lay minister going around preaching at churches oh and, house, uh, yeah. and, and had been mentored. and. Uh, when she became pregnant, my siblings tried to help her get the money. They didn't ask me because they didn't think I would participate. Mm -hmm. But when I found out she was pregnant, I just judged her. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say anything bad to her. I know she admired me greatly. I ignored her. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, to this day, you know, uh, what, we did a, a, a long form interview and I was able to publicly apologize mm -hmm. to her. Mm -hmm. uh, but that reality informs uh, the hopefulness and the compassion that I have for other women and um, 
my sister's smarter than me, and I don't mm. say that as a as a uh, and I'm pretty I'm pretty crackerjack, <laughs> yeah. but my sister's yeah. smarter than me, yeah. but she has a high school education. She's mm-hmm. done the most with what she had, but I mm-hmm. her trajectory I don't. Who knows where she? Right, you love your up. nephew, and you love right, that. Absolutely. And she was married to the father right. for some time. Right. I mean, there's but my sister has done far more with less than I've done with all the education that I mm-hmm. have. Mm-hmm. So I love her dearly, and she's been a mentor to me in that way. Mm-hmm. My, my, uh, my, the radical respect I have mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. women in their agency and their equality is informed by. Yeah, that, that's my another sister. piece of the book that really resonated with me because I also had a sister who was pregnant at fourteen, and mm-hmm. and. You know, just trying to manage that as a family and and just the shame and the stigma and um, it's it's really uh, it's it's hard to it was, that I was very emotional throughout that piece of the book and also self reflexive trying to think did I judge my sister I mean we rallied around her and you know she's now an orthodontist she you know her, she's you know she's doing okay but 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 I it just that was just such sure. an emotional piece of the book I want to shift gears a little bit because um. I want to try to talk about the moral argument before sure. we before we run out of time. And um, you know, there are there is as I'm reading the book, there are or listening to the book, I'm all thinking ahead, like, well, he hasn't talked about this yet, he hasn't talked about that, and you end up talking about everything that I might anticipate uh, that you that you that I thought you should talk about uh, in the text. But a couple of these pieces are really really uh, important. Uh, one of them, because we're in Philadelphia, uh, is the Gosnell uh, sort of sort of uh, 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 tragedy, and. You, you know, m- most folks in this debate saw what Gosnell was doing as an argument uh, for the moral majority, for the antis, as you as you call them. You saw it a different way. Can you can you explain? Well, the reality of the circumstances that bred a Dr. Gosnell in Philadelphia was the degree to which we deny women access to this care and we make them desperate. Yep. Uh, we failed, we refused to recognize that since before we called it abortion, uh, women were figuring out ways to end pregnancies Mm -hmm. and that they will do that whether it's legal or not, whether it's safe or not. Mm -hmm. And so by the the expectation that women have legal access to abortion, but the hyper-regulation of it, driving women to not have funding, uh, to regulating normal uh, uh, safe clinics out of business, uh, when they ask women why they went to Dr. Gosnell despite the reputation they said. He said, he saw me when nobody else would and he was affordable, all right? And th- those are functions of how we've treated ab- uh, abortion. And then the, the, uh, the, the, the opportunism and the, what I call the Jedi mind trick was the racialization of abortion mm-hmm. and the racialization of uh, the, 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 the significance assigned to Dr. Gosnell being black, mm-hmm. obviously uh, they try and guilt me by association. He's black, I'm black. Mm. Uh, and I've been called you know, the second coming of Gosnell. And I say, I'm the anti-Gosnell. Right. You know, I am the counter narrative. Right. You know, I do this work because you put women in a position to mm-hmm. have to go to somebody who doesn't have their best interest mm-hmm. at heart. So uh, the racialization of abortion uh, and the uh, victim blaming by forcing women into circumstances where they make desperate choices mm-hmm. and then uh, blaming them for making those choices uh, mm-hmm. is, is heinous in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so a couple of things in the book are really radical in my, in my opinion and um, we were talking and I said this backstage, you know, I, when I first got here, and Lauren will attest this, I, I, was, I asked if your security was here. That was my first question yeah. coming here because in reading the book, I'm yeah. realizing how perilous the work is um, that you do. But what's interesting to me is that the ideas in the book to me are more dangerous than even some of the work that you do just because of how profound they are. And two of them are really striking and I'd like for you to reflect on them as a way of sharing with the audience a little bit about what this moral argument is. Um, you, you do First of all, the book is like an archive, right? So it, it is, it's an archive of... Uh, the history of of the religious right in some ways. It's also an archive of um, of policy around around re- women's reproductive rights. Um, but along the way, two things that really struck out to me as being really powerful and radical were the the following. One um, is that you really 
articulate very clearly the role that patriarchy, even from biblical times, plays into the kinds of conversations that we're having right now. So I hope you can share a little bit, a bit of that with the audience, just how patriarchy, the dominance of it, the hegemony of it, over-determines even some of the kind of conversations we can have in the, in the realm of women's reproductive rights, and that that goes back to prehistoric times. Um, but then I think the second piece that also was really striking to me is just, because um, you talk about the racialization of, 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 of abortion, um, you have some really insightful and I think absolutely accurate discussions and honest discussions about how race informs this particular debate. Um, and I don't think anyone that I've seen talking about this publicly has been as courageous in just saying point blank <clears throat> that some of this has to do with white folks' fears about their race dying out. Um, and, and part of the, the impetus for patriarchy's power in controlling women is to try to sort of shape or rig that game, so to speak. Um, and the way that plays out is always counterintuitive, so we don't always think of uh, denying poor women and women of color mostly around these issues as also denying wealthier liberal white women from it, but you say that's a slippery slope, and actually it does. So yeah. I'm saying a lot here because there's so much here, but can you just speak to how sure. patriarchy and racism sure. Sure. Um, um, shape this discussion? Yeah. Well, first I'll let you in on a little joke that I think is gone now. I used to say that patriarchy and racism have, were why I could hide in the open because patriarchy uh, always said that, and, and racism said the doctor was always a white man. So when the first time a journalist came down to Mississippi with me to interview me and wrote the, uh, the abortion ministry of Dr. Willie Parker, uh, he looked just like me with a beard and a goatee. I was rocking a goatee at the time. But he was white. And I, mm. and I said, if they say we're going to shoot the doctor, brother, you in trouble, you're going to take one for the team, <laughs> right? Because they're going to assume they're that assume you are the doctor, doctor. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so, but, but if you let me disarticulate my, 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 hover, my, my cloaking device for a minute to say that the patriarchy, you know, since uh, the, you know, the, the moral argument comes from the fact that we live in a, and an unofficial theocracy. We don't have an official religion, but we do. Mm -hmm. And that official religion is WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism and fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the whole uh, norm of, of God as being masculine mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of creates a disparity in, in, in moral authority. Uh, and so it infantilizes and demotes women in the agency around the issues that play out in their body. Mm. And so, uh, because the, 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 the nuclear family with the patriarch, the, the, the male is the head of the household, mm. the woman is the help meet, you know, and so when women have aspirations beyond that traditional model, mm. uh, they uh, are put back in their place. Mm. And the most essential way you can control a woman's aspirations is by controlling her reproduction. Mm -hmm. Because if she doesn't control her reproduction, she doesn't control anything else by her life. Mm -hmm. The impregnating of women is really a form or a way of sub subordinating them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, women, I was talking to my friend, Dr. Francis uh, Batzler, who was on the board with me at Physicians for Reproductive Health. We were just talking about when women who have aspirations outside the home but who still consider their primary identity as, as mother, they have to do double duty. Mm. You're, you become a doctor mom, you know, and if you choose not to become a mother, that is counterintuitive and it is, is it immoral and illogical. Mm. And so patriarchy sets that up such that we, uh, we uh, infantilize the agency of women and we trap them in the lives that we project, we force onto them mm -hmm. because we take away their ability to control their fertility and when they become mothers, mm -hmm. we then sacralize motherhood. Mm -hmm. And so- You think we're losing the public battle on this. Absolutely. Because you see more and more liberals also embracing right. this sort of cult of mommyhood. You, you, you can do it all, you know, the helicopter mom. We, you know, the whole notion that, uh, a, a woman is, every woman's a potential mother first. Mm. And so anything she wants on top of that is extra, right? And for her to reject that primary identity. So what that does is because the, we have this culture of motherhood that's also modulated by resources to become mothers, mm -hmm. uh, middle class women, if they're not mindful of the privilege they hold, they undermine the interests of women who don't have the same resources. Mm. So when women are making decisions about their lives, mm. 
So when poor women living in abject poverty with children are trying to figure out how I'm going to feed the babies I have, mm -hmm. let alone the one that's in my belly, mm -hmm. it's about to come, mm -hmm. um, when they're making critical decisions about how to continue feeding the ones that they have, and that means I won't continue this pregnancy, you know, people who say, I don't see what's wrong with the waiting period, mm -hmm. because you're not mindful of the fact that your privilege, if it informs, if you let that dull you to the, tr to the uh, life chances of somebody else, you're aiding and abetting. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that, the whole black genocide, which is my favorite part of the book. Yeah, you, 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 you right, hate the right, black genocide right, right, piece. Right, right. Share, share, share with you. So that. the reason is because it's the ultimate Jedi mind trick. For folks who don't know about the black genocide movement, can you briefly Sure, sure. briefly. In uh, 2009, uh, the latest iteration of the Declaration of Abortion as Black Genocide as a plot hatched by Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger to kill off black women and black babies. Um, that conspiracy was fostered by a, a, a fake documentary called My Alpha 21, and it had people up in alarms. It had billboards that said the most dangerous place for uh, a black child is in the womb. Every 21 minutes, we, we, we were killing our next potential leader with a picture of President Obama. Uh, and those kinds of just really uh, inflammatory things. And so when I, when I started to connect the dots, uh, the fact that the same people who uh, insist that black women have, black ba have babies, but at the same time they cut off the very resources that would be necessary to parent with a modicum of dignity, mm -hmm. and at the same time these are the same people who are anti-immigrant and uh, kicking people out of the country because they're brown. Pro-capital punishment. Pro-capital punishment. Uh, those, they have found a way to kind of cloak their real interest, which is controlling the fertility of white women, mm -hmm. because they have a, a paranoia about becoming racially obsolete. And what they understand is if they can undermine abortion access for poor women and women of color, they can undermine it for all women. And so they're not really interested in the fertility of, of, of people of color and poor people. They're interested in making sure they replenish the white race so that skin privilege can continue. Because mm -hmm. what they understand is, the only person who can have a white baby is a white woman with a white man. Because if a white man impregnates a non-white woman, that baby's not white. If a white woman is impregnated by a non-white man, that baby's not white. So if you believe that you're becoming racially obsolete, you need to control the fertility of white women so that you can replenish the race and preserve the white privilege. Mm -hmm. And so that's the only way cutting off resources to parent and denying access to birth control while you're saying have, have a baby. Uh, it's the only way it makes sense in the face of uh, anti-immigrant sentiments and the like. So I call it the ultimate Jedi mind trick. And if we weren't in this era that we're in now, I'd sound like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> but if you look at the alt-right movement, the anti-immigrant movement, the, the, the effort to control women's fertility and to drive them back into the home because there are too many white women who are taking birth control, who are going to school, and who are working outside the home to directly confront them after all a white woman almost became the most powerful person on the planet. <laughs> mm. And they said that we're not ready for that yet. Mm. The most qualified candidate ever was stopped in her tracks, which means even mediocre white men can control a woman who supersedes their abilities. Mm. 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 Well, good evening, Dr. Parker. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, Please, first, just one question, okay, sir. Okay, one okay. question. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, well, my first motive, Single question that I had was, <laughs> we want to get in as many people as possible. Single question that I had was uh, about uh, women that were uh, impregnated. Uh, now, uh, however, what are it, the top 10 reasons, in your opinion, why women get uh, abortions? Um, uh, that's a, that's a, thanks for the question. Uh, there aren't I won't say 10 reasons, but there are multiple reasons. Very seldom does a woman have a single reason. Uh, it, it's a function of uh, right now it's not the right time for her with regard to what her aspirations are. The relationship may be dysfunctional. She may have health reasons that would make it unsafe to continue. Uh, her, uh, uh, she may be in a, an, in a, uh, a battered relationship. There are multiple reasons most women have two or three that come together. And the, one of the, the things that modulates who has abortions, uh, 
black women followed by Latino women have the highest rates of unintended pregnancy, but they also live in life circumstances that make them more likely to have multiple reasons that would lead them to consider abortion. So it's always multifactorial. Such as highest infant mortality rates, right. highest maternity mortality rates. Absolutely. And so we always say in medicine when we, it's like saying, it's complicated, we say it's multifactorial. <laughs> but Doc, one, one quick follow-up yeah, to that, yeah. because it isn't part of the point of the book, though, is that, because that's a great question, yeah. right? But the question also reveals the weakness in the discussion, which is women's autonomy to, like, right. we want to know what the reasons are. Right. Right. But the reality is, is, is women should have the agency to make those determinations for themselves. Right. That's exactly right. The, the people that are reading your book, the people that are here, are people that agree with you. <laughs> Um, and when speaking to my mom, someone whose uh, number one reason she's against abortion is my niece, okay. who's a beautiful young woman now. Sure. What do we say, how do we hold the conversation with people whose reasons are so emotional, whose mm -hmm. reasons are maybe not based in science or sociology or um, reason? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we say to them that can kind of, like what, in your experience, what's the most effective way to hold this conversation with someone that has disagreed with you? Okay, that's a very important question. I think um, how you engage is as important as what you're talking about. So I think for me, I don't have an agenda to convince anybody of anything. Mm. Uh, I don't have an agenda to change <laughs> people's minds. What I'm, what I'm hoping is people will become more thoughtful and my goal is to introduce facts and reason into a narrative that's been void of that because uh, we've smugly with science and empirical thinking, thinking if I just put the facts out there, it is what it is, <laughs> right? And that's left a void in the public sphere because the people who are opposed to abortion philosophically have been more than willing to fill that void with misinformation, alternative facts, and sometimes outright lies. Mm -hmm. So when I engage people, people who want to debate me, I'm not willing really to debate. If you want to have an honest disagreement, uh, I try and set the terms of the conversation. Let's agree to disagree. I am committed to being committed to uh, deconstructing corrupt systems, but not penalizing the people who are caught in them. So I only have opponents, I don't have any enemies because on this issue, I'm even arguing for the rights of the person who's opposing me. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think if you're willing to be in relationship and to honest, di honestly disagree, a good start would be to give that person my book. Yep. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and I say that sincerely because I wrote this book and I tried to frame it so that it would, be, it would have intellectual rigor and integrity of, 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 of compassion and mm -hmm. spirituality because Dr. King said that science gives mankind knowledge, which is power. Religion gives mankind wisdom, which is control. The two are not enemies. And what we end up with is this false divide between two realities that has to inform how we process through the world. Mm -hmm. So I've been able to successfully deconstruct that and to try and have people to navigate that space. And so uh, I think honest disagreement is the beginning of progress. But you have to be willing to talk to people. And you can't start with, you're just crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's a lot in the book that will give you great tools uh, for, for, for the discussion, particularly, and I didn't want to spoil that here because I think people need to read this and experience themselves. Uh, Dr. Parker has an extraordinarily eloquent uh, sort of description of the sacred um, and, and how he sort of maps uh, traditional notions of what's sacred onto choice arguments. And so I think, I think the book will be a great tool for you. Hi, thanks so much, Dr. Parker. I wanted to follow up on what you said about how you never really faced the question of abortion in your education, in medical school or residency. And uh, I'll second that. I went to medical school and residency and been practicing for a number of years, and I never, this is the first lecture I've ever been to about wow. okay. <laughs> abortion, wow. quite honestly. And um, so my question for you uh, is about medical education. Yeah. And, um, what can, what can we introduce as medical educators for our students early on, first year, second year, sure. and then residency? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an important question. I'm happy to uh, report that the expectation of learning uh, abortion care and contraception is being mainstreamed kind of by uh, uh, 
demand, consumer demand, the consumer being medical students and residents, because now with an organization like Med Students for Choice, uh, people are <laughs> choosing where they go to medical school or where they do their residency based on making sure that they're exposed to that content. Even at the undergraduate level, you have uh, uh, reproductive justice and uh, reproductive rights interest groups forming with people aspiring to enter to, into medicine, uh, in particular to provide that care. So I see that there's stuff in the pipeline, uh, and we've also gained control over the regulatory mechaniz mechanisms where the, uh, the, the College of Graduate Medical Education that shapes what is considered uh, core content is now starting to have as a requirement uh, exposure and training in, in family planning and abortion such that now you have to opt out instead of having to say, where can I go where they'll give me this knowledge? You have to now say, I, I have to make a case for opting out of the care. So the all of the pieces are in place. The final piece that I think will really make a difference is if uh, women or, or females who are, people who are seeking reproductive health care would screen their providers and say, okay, if I had an unplanned pregnancy, how would we deal with this? Mm -hmm. If that provider, mm -hmm. if that provider said, I, we, we'll, I do abortions, we'll take care of it in my practice, go to that person. If that person says, I don't do them in here in this facility, but I have, uh, I have indexed re referrals, I'll make it. If that person says, uh, I don't deal with that and I won't help you with that, then you should consider that that person doesn't deserve the privilege of caring for you. Mm -hmm. So. That's the woman's solidarity piece that's absolutely. really important. Here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Parker. So uh, I am a minister who works for an organization that tries to mm -hmm. um, get religious leaders on board as it relates to reproductive justice, but also related to LGBTQ yeah. concerns. Yeah, I met you, wrote it. Hey, girl. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I was, I was just trying to decide between two questions. I think I'll go with the second one in my mind. So even though you've made a political decision, a moral decision, to be on the front lines of this particular movement, I know, we know that as people who walk alongside pe folks who experience reproductive loss, however they do, mm -hmm. that that's spiritually um, dis disconnecting work. Mm -hmm. It can be. So I'm interested in how you navigate that space. What are some of the things you do to stay grounded, to stay centered, even as you are convicted, as you said, mm -hmm. to stay on the front lines? How do, you, how do you reckon with dealing with reproductive loss all day long? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, seeing all experiences as a part of the human experience and uh, participating in what I call, we all are participating in meaning making. And so uh, I define experience not as what happens to you, but rather as what you do with what happens to you. And so when women are coming to me and they are uh, deciding to uh, take control of their lives back by ending a pregnancy or someone is uh, losing a very much desired pregnancy. Um, my goal around trying to deconstruct the categorical understanding about reproduction so it's that childbirth is better than an abortion, is better than miscarriage, is better than adoption. These are all points along a reproductive continuum. And so they take on the value of the person experiencing it. So my goal... Uh, is to not uh, in, to participate in the meaning making of people who come to me for help is to try and create a space that is uh, uh, free so that people can assign the value that they want to assign to their reproductive experience uh, and that's you, that's try to create a space of no judgment and uh, of respect uh, and trying to intervene when uh, people are being encroached upon by an overarching moral understanding. For example, women who are made to feel like they're failures if they have reproductive loss because they can't have a baby, or, or women who choose not to have a, a baby are made to feel like they are rejecting some primary role that they have. Mm -hmm. So uh, I stay grounded in uh, trying to uh, create space for women to uh, have their full autonomy and, and their, their respect. 
uh, and that energizes me. The purpose that I find in doing my work uh, is nuclear for me because I don't grow weary of trying to stand in the gap for people nobody else will help. Hi, Dr. Parker. Hello. I heard you. Uh, I heard your interview with Marty Mus Mus Muscoine, um on NPR, and I just uh, would like you to talk a little bit more about how you you, you took the concept of pro-life and um, you kind of turned it around in a way that I, I thought was 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 wonderful. And I would just like you to sp speak a little bit about that. And then added to that, I'm, I'm very worried that, you know, we're in very perilous times. <laughs> and I, I just would like to also hear from you, is how can we protect um, uh, the right to a safe, accessible, and affordable abortion care? Sure. So, you know, um, my, my mantra, some people uh, are in, in pursuit of a more civil discourse. I say, uh, and they're looking for the middle ground. You can't have a middle ground when you have uh, false equivalence, yep. right? So the whole pro-life, pro-choice narrative <laughs> leads to false equivalence. So how do you come into the middle of, of, of a false construct? You can't. So I'm more interested in honest disagreement. And if you're going to honestly disagree, you have to. Your point of departure has to be the facts and the reality. So. Uh, in terms of deconstructing the pro-life, pro-choice narrative, uh, not, not in a, as, as a, again, a Jedi mind trick, I say I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life of the woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that also leads me to, if someone's engaging me around when life begins, to explain that. That's a little lengthy, I won't go into that, but what I mean by being pro-life of the woman, I simply believe that uh, bodily integrity uh, and agency means that every process occurring in the body of a woman is subject to her governance. Mm -hmm. So uh, a pregnancy, a woman having a pregnancy doesn't subordinate her. Uh, so uh, uh, you can't have more of an interest in the fetus that a woman's carrying than you do in the woman who's carrying it. Mm. You can't give rights to a fetus that you don't take away from the woman, right? Mm -hmm. So my notion of uh, if, if someone says a fetus is a person, we can debate that. But the more salient question for me is, tell me when a woman is not a person. Mm. Mm. And then finally, what we can do to sustain is to realize that as the, old, as the mothers in my community used to say with the civil rights setback, in times like these, we've, it's always been times like these. We just can't lose <laughs> the heart to know that there's never going to be a day that you don't have to struggle for right, because when you, the day that they lose, they're going to come regroup and come back. And if you, what, what, you're worth, what you're fighting for is worth fighting for, you need to regroup and go forward. Mm -hmm. You don't get a day off from justice. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, good to see you. Um, so I know you worked for a while here in Philadelphia, and Absolutely. now you're working in the South, in Alabama and Mississippi. So I wonder if you could compare the two, because <laughs> here in Pennsylvania, we've been restricting abortion at the forefront of that for a long time, but Alabama and Mississippi now seem to be getting all the headlines in that regard. So how do you compare the practice in the two different regions? Well, I, 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 uh, I, I disabuse people of the notion that they can make, uh, that people can make themselves feel better by fancying that they live in a better place, by, uh, by adopting Malcolm X's dis, uh, response when he was asked if, if he thought that race relations were better in the North. He says, no, uh, they're no better in the North than they are in the South. He says, they're as bad up South as they are down South. And the person said, what do you mean by that? He said, I define South as any place South of the Canadian border. <laughs> right? So women's aspirations increasingly around reproduction in this country are, uh, you know, tell uh, someone in Philly that abortion access is easier than it is in Mississippi, they beg to differ. And I would agree with them because I've worked in both places. So mm -hmm. I think we falsely reassure ourselves, like I, I call it, uh, and, and get ready for the shock of this word, niggerization, the niggerization process of how states niggerize each other. Mm -hmm. Now, the connotation of nigger is that it means a black person, but I'm gonna use Cornell West notion of niggerization is the process of subordinating one group for the purpose of enhancing your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So states make themselves feel better when they say, okay, we may not be the best, but at least we're not Mississippi, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when people do that, it means that 
you know, if you're looking behind yourself, if you're looking to see how far, you know, how far you are ahead, you lose ground. So I think uh, states, when they have no intention of improving the situation, uh, they make you feel better about where you are by comparing you to some place that they hope you'll perceive as worse off than you are. Mm. As a longtime Planned Parenthood board member here in Philly, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so my question is, your language is so amazing around women. And was any of that in your mind when you decided to become an OBGYN or in a way you couldn't articulate but looking back on it? I mean, how did you choose this particular field mm. when you could have been anything? Mm. But thank you for sure. picking this field. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you know, as I said, when I observed that radical inequality and just my, my, my core sense that that was not, that I sensed the injustice in terms of the stratified responsibility around sexuality. Uh, my, over time, I've uh, done consciousness raising. I've uh, wanted to be uh, clear. And so my thinking and my ability to process reality caught up with my values. And my values were, you know, clarified by me being able to uh, understand what uh, uh, gender discrimination was and to process it. And then that allowed me to uh, self-analyze about where I stood and whether or not I was a part of the problem or not. Um, but my thinking certainly evolved. Uh, I would not have self-described as a feminist, and now some people won't even let me describe as a feminist. I either have to be an ally versus a feminist, and I just decided that while people figure out what to call me, I'm going to do justice work, mm. right? Mm. So, um, but I think the, the short answer is, uh, I like what Muhammad Ali said when, you, when uh, he said that if a, if a man... Uh, thinks the same way at 50 as he did at 20, mm. he's wasted 30 years. Mm. So I'd like to think that I haven't wasted the last <laughs> 34 years by thinking the same at 20. I, I think I'm, I'm much more capable of thinking now, and now I know what to call a lot of the things that I saw, but I didn't know what to call them. Mm -hmm. Dr. Parker, thank you. I'm not actually here because I agree with you, but I love the way that you honor your mother, and I love the way that you honor women. So thank you for that. I also am in, have been in the mental health field for 42 years, and I've seen a lot of people who have had abortions come in and now depressed and have uh, talk about trauma and all. And I'm wondering, what kind of safeguards do you put in to help people really make good decisions? And then secondly, are we doing anything in the medical community to help psychiatrists and psychologists and all to be able to help women? Because I believe people shouldn't be judged either, and we should help people heal. Thank you so much. And I think it's just as important for you to, I appreciate the spirit of you uh, registering where you stand. Uh, I think, uh, one of the things that I've decided in that, that uh, is important to women uh, to protect them psychically if they make the decisions that is not to infantilize them in their lived experience and to trust them to be able to make the decisions that they make and to not to try and protect them from their own decisions. Uh, that means that I have a different perspective on regret than some people do. I think uh, regret uh, is probably less injurious than uh, uh, denial and being uh, denied the opportunity to make a bad decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's more injurious than making a bad decision and living with the decision that you make. Uh, so I think uh, regret is not a function of which decision you make, it's a function of decision making. And so I think uh, one of the things we've done uh, as a disservice to women as we force them to reject any notion of prim primacy of motherhood is when they decide not to become mothers is to introduce the notion that there's something mentally unstable about that. Mm -hmm. So I try and reinforce for women that whichever decision they make in the context of their clarity, that's a valid decision for them and that they will deal with that and live with that. They can live with that decision they make, but they, it's going to be harder for them to live with uh, a, a, a decision that I denied them the opportunity to make. Uh, and I think uh, in, in treatment for the real mental health issues that uh, exist and not, it, it, you know, the evidence shows that there's really no such thing as uh, post-abortion syndrome with regard to mental illness above the baseline of what you would see in any woman living in a society. Uh, but there is a real crisis of mental illness and a lack 
of resources for that. Yep. And I think there are lived experiences that make me make it so that women have differential prevalence of, you know, if women have more mental illnesses because men drive them crazy, yep. right? <laughs> so in a patriarchal society, maybe you do see more women yep. needing mental health services, That's of right. which there's a tremendous deficit. But women are not mentally unstable because they make decisions that other people would not make for them. Mm. And so I think we need to understand that. Um, my question is about the fact that reproductive justice and abortion is still considered just a women's issue. And I'm kind of on the fence about whether I consider it a women's issue. But what do you think we can do, number one, to kind of engage men on the issue? What do you think is the entry point for men? And also, what, if anything, can we possibly do to take the incredible burden and responsibility that we put on women with unwanted pregnancies and move that in any way to the men that get them pregnant? Well, I think that's a, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a catch-22. I think uh, men being involved in the decision-making around pregnancy can become problematic because the direct consequences of pregnancy do not accrue to them. I think uh, we can, what we can do is uh, socialize men towards more responsible sexual behavior and uh, standing in partnership with women such that if they are sexually involved and a pregnancy occurs, that they first understand the primary decision making around that belongs to the person who's going to incur the direct consequences, the most pressing one, which is a health consequence of death or injury. And so there, I don't think there's any notion, I don't have any notion of paternal rights around uh, pregnancy decision making, other than you can choose to support the woman in whatever decision she makes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the way we would shift the burden from women you, 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 to, to men is have uh, shift us towards uh, gender equality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, women, uh, Women uh, having the resources that they need if they choose to, to parent or to, uh, if they become pregnant and the male is not involved, uh, we have to stop treating uh, uh, pregnancy like it's an entrapment for men and we have to make sure that it's not an entrapment for women. So I think gender equality, without specifically saying men need to do more, it would be what men need to do more of is not be in women's way when they decide, when they have to make a decision around pregnancy. And we, we have to also stop treating men like they're the problem. So for men who are involved and who, who are supportive, but I think men need to act on other men, you know, to uh, foster the notion of e equality uh, and, and mutual respect and support. I think that's the biggest favor I can do uh, a, a, a woman is to socialize other men to respect women to the degree that I try to. Mm -hmm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dr. Willie James Parker.